11 10 a.m eastern and that means it's time for our teaching showcase i'm josh wilson from Longsite. Uh, i serve in the sakai community as lead for product and lead for marketing i serve on sakai's governance team um, and i do all sorts of other stuff um, and it's going to be kind of fun to be moderating this hour this morning so uh, and I uh, just want to send out my uh, my good wishes and my apologies to the folks in Ann Arbor. I had really wished to be with you in person today, and that just didn't get to happen. So um, anyway, thinking of all of you folks in Ann Arbor that I won't get to see in person. All right, on to the teaching showcase. Let me share a couple of quick thoughts about how this is going to go, and then we will dive right in. So here we go. So the, the plan here, this is going to be about 50 minutes long. Um, so that means we have three uh, sets of presenters. So two individual presenters and one pair of presenter, one pair. Uh, yeah, one presenter pair. There we go. <laughs> um, and so each of those, each, each presenter team will have 15 minutes. And the idea is going to be about seven minutes, give or take a little for your presentation and about eight minutes, give or take a little for questions and answers. So the questions and answers will come first from our panel of super fans and then from anyone else who's participating. So if you have a question for a presenter, please do post it in the chat. Uh, don't send it to me, send it to everyone and that way everyone can see and I'll make sure that that question gets raised. So who are our presenters? So we have three terrific presenters today. So we've got Krista Daniels from Antioch University, and she's going to be telling us about Bichronus courses. If you do not know what Bichronus courses are, this will be your opportunity. A lot of us had, know about what goes into Bichronus courses, but I think the, the way that Antioch does this is going to be pretty interesting for all of us to hear. Next up will be Natalina Parker from Pepperdine University, and she's going to show us a self-paced new faculty orientation. That should be super fun. And then rounding out our, our, our panel here from the University of Dayton, Sarah Tangerman and Katarina Tsuma, who will be showing us an asynchronous physiology course. So Sarah is the ID, Katarina is the faculty member. This should be kind of fun. And I want to mention also our panel of super fans. This worked out really well last year. We were inspired by uh, Dancing with the Stars. We called this Teaching with the Stars last year, but it was too much pressure to be named a star. So this this year, it's just a showcase, but uh, we're, we're still pretty excited about our super fans. So Julianne Morgan from the University of Dayton. She is an academic engagement lead and an active member of the Sakai community. Also, Christina Schweibert from Northwest State Community College. Uh, her role is in instructional design and distance learning. Both Julianne and Christina uh, serve very actively in the Sakai community in various different kinds of ways. Um, we're super grateful for all the things that they do. And last year during this teaching showcase, they had really, really interesting questions to uh, for our presenters. So I'm, I'm putting them on the spot, calling them out, and uh, you know, hoping that they are able to uh, rise to the challenge that I'm giving them. So I, I'm, I'm certain that they will. They were amazing last year, and they have great things to say. So with that said, let me stop my screen share. Let me turn this over to our first presenter. So Krista Daniels, you're going to be able to start sharing your slides momentarily here. And I will keep time. So, so we're, we're going to consider our first session to be starting at 11.15. And I will give you a, uh, a little sign when you're close to your seven-minute warning. So Krista, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you very much. Um, so I only have seven minutes for presenting and then lots of time for questions. So I'll try not to go too fast, uh, but try to cover everything in this short, I think a seven slide presentation. So I'm going to be talking about how to engage in a brightness model and, and using Sakai as the platform specifically. And so for those of you that don't know, but I think you already do, what brightness really means is when you're teaching fully online um, and you're using synchronous time and you're using asynchronous time. It's not a hybrid model, there's no choice. So the full course runs and you'll have maybe weekly Zoom meetings that are in synchronous where the students and faculty come together at the same time on Zoom um, to brainstorm, to talk about the content, to do activities. And then the remainder of the course that week, let's say, is asynchronous. Um, and that's where they're accessing all their materials and activities. And they're interacting with other students and even faculty within a time frame. Um, however, it's asynchronous, so it'll be at different times 
with say a deadline, right? At the end of the week or at the end of the month. And so we're using Sakai to support all our asynchronous time for our course. So a couple things just to know about using Bicronis that I think many of you are familiar with, which is it needs to be really intentional to think really through what is going to be during your Zoom time in real time, and then what are you putting in your asynchronous course time? And as many of you know, this uh, creates a lot of upfront work for instructors and faculty. So that's also something to be just cognizant of is the amount of time that you're planning uh, on your Sakai page to ensure that it's engaging um, and doing what you want it to do. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is go over these engagement strategies that we use um, specifically for our asynchronous time. I'm not going to focus on the synchronous time. I'm going to focus on the things we do in Sakai. And then I'll have examples where I'll showcase images of the Sakai site and how we're doing that strategy. And then I'll take you through the entire course in a whole so you can see how it all flows together. So the one, two, three, four, five strategies are creating video lectures, presentations, and podcasts for students to engage on, um, letting students be able to curate, uh, and for us to curate together existing resources, videos, and talks, um, allowing students to contribute and expand content that's already out there. Uh, the obvious one and traditional one, having students do readings, and then really trying to build community and connection. And so I'll start with the first one, which is creating video lectures, presentations, and podcasts. So we use different tools that are either in Sakai or we can embed in Sakai. So we're either using a Zoom video that we then turn into a YouTube video. We're using Panopto very often now. Um, we're using Google Slides. We're using VoiceThread quite often as an external tube. And for this course, for example, I put in the beginning of the course an embedded presentation on systems thinking and how it can solve wicked problems. So this will be part of their asynchronous time as they're going through week one, say, um, and they get to watch this video. And then they'll be answering questions maybe in the assignment section of Sakai. Creating existing resources, videos, and talks, I usually use, you know, regular web page links, or I upload resources in Sakai, and then I link to those resources for students to be able to watch. So here you can see an example of required videos that I've embedded in Sakai. And sometimes it's not just videos, sometimes it's images, um, or sometimes it's embedding other resources. So on the right, um, on this page, I'll have something like, how can you succeed in this course? Um, here's your ultimate cheat sheet for critical thinking. So in every page in Sakai, lesson page that I use, I might have a tip for how they can succeed in the course. And so when I show you the whole site, you'll see how that flows and how that makes it easy for them to follow. Um, expanding and contributing content. This is where I tend to use a lot of external tools that I embed right in Sakai. And what I have found is that some of those tools that are really useful for students to be able to talk together and collaborate offline during asynchronous time is we found a lot of success with Wakelet, um, which I'll, again, like I said, I'll show you in the whole site. Um, VoiceThread, and in this example, you can see how we have an assignment. Um, we use the assignment tool in Sakai. And then what I do is I create the assignment, but then I have a link to VoiceThread. So instead of just submitting a document, they actually go to VoiceThread and they will upload a presentation they did with other students for everybody to see. And then students can comment on that presentation within VoiceThread. Readings, um, you know, that's probably the easiest one that you see in Sakai all the time, you know, just having required readings instead of just telling them where to find the readings, I usually try to link them directly into Sakai. Um, sometimes we'll link the library um, so they can actually get to the reading that way as well, if it's an ebook, making it a little bit easier for them. And building community and connection. This goes back to a lot of the time we'll have a normal assignment and instead of just a regular Word document or something like that they might submit, we tend to use things like Jamboard, VoiceThread, as I mentioned before, even Wakelet. And so we'll create the assignment in Sakai, 
and it will be graded in Sakai with the grade book, but the assignment is where they have to go to an external tool perhaps. And so in this example, we're asking them to do their comments in a Jamboard. And so let me pull up the full site. I also have in the presentation, the full site recorded so that if you miss something, you can always go back when you access this and see the site without me being here. So how we use Sakai, like I said, is we have lessons and each lesson is a week. So I'm gonna go to an example to show all those different tools and resources that we use. So we try to make our Sakai always the same. We use the exact same template for all the classes that are by Kernis. So when they come to the course, they know they're first gonna get a description of the course, they're going to see what the meeting times are for when it's synchronous. They're going to see their learning outcomes. And then they're going to get a checklist so that they can check off everything that week that they have to do, um, even if they're not with me synchronously. And then here's an example of how we use VoiceThread. So you can click on the assignment, and it actually takes you to an embedded VoiceThread that we can actually put within Sakai. And then students can play what I have here, and then they can actually hit this button and upload their own recording, and everybody has access to it. The other example I was talking about was looking at another assignment that can make it very interactive, which is embedding Wakelet. And so you can see it in two places. You can actually embed it on the left in the toolbar for students. There's the class Wakelet, so I can get to it in multiple ways. Um, and then it takes you right to that site. It's embedded within Sakai. And this is where students can curate and put things together um, that they're using for um, the course. Let me just go back. And so you'll see how when we're using this model, they know they have two class meeting times that they must uh, attend and that's the synchronous time. But everything else they have to do is all on their own time within this time frame, September 10th through the 16th. So they'll go through this site, this platform, and they'll see, okay, here are my required assignments. Here's a traditional assignment that they have to submit a page. And then here are the assignments that go to embedded tools. So here was an assignment for posting a voice thread. Here's a wakelet assignment that's not even due till October 4th, but I like to put it a little early so they know that it's coming. And then they can go through each week and they can go ahead. There's nothing restricting them in my class. I know in some classes we do restrict them from moving ahead before completing something. But in this class, as long as they're doing everything when it's due, they can do the first two weeks if they wanted to within a week. And it follows exactly like I was saying. It makes it very easy for them to follow because they have welcome to the course, here are their readings, here would be their objectives, here's their checklist again that they get to check off, and then getting down to the assignments. So Krista, this yep. is amazing. Um, it, it, we're about uh, nine or so minutes yep. in. I'm, I'm I would ready love to open the floor for questions. I'm, yeah. I'm so glad for the opportunity to see your course. Let's let's go to our panel of super fans. So, uh, Christina, do you want to take us to your question first? Sure. sure. Let me make sure. I'm trying to. Getting a bit of an echo. I'm happy to ask a question if, if I'm not echoing. Nope, you're not echoing. Julianne, that would be great. Thank you for jumping in. Sure. Um, so I loved your course site. Thank you for that really great walkthrough. I really appreciate how you've put everything for a specific week on one page with all the instructions, all the links out. It makes it easy for the students to get a really good understanding. And I like how you have the same layout from week to week. So beautiful. Um, I did have a question though. Um, so I saw a lot of external tools being used. I wonder if you've tried out any of the internal tools that can be used in Sakai for engagement, like comments or questions or anything like that. Sure, absolutely. Yes. And um, I was 
I usually use those like discussion forums, um, comments. I've used those many times. Um, I thought maybe people would be very familiar with those tools because they're within Sakai. Uh, Panopto is within our Sakai site now as well for recording videos and placing them up. So I wanted to show some ways that you can actually use external tools as well within Sakai and embed them. Um, so that it's not like you're just, because the embed tool um, for an external tool is really helpful, I find, because it's not always just a link to some outside site. Like you saw, the voice thread can actually be embedded within your lesson page, and then it takes you outside, but they see it within the Sakai platform. Um, so it feels, I think, very um, intuitive to them to help. Yeah, I definitely saw some tools that I haven't actually played around with myself, so it's really helpful to see those. Um, maybe one thing I'll follow up with is because you've got them embedded, those external tools embedded, and it does feel so seamless, do you find that students do, like, they have a pretty good experience navigating through all these different external tools? Yeah, one thing I've had to do, and I will see if I have it here just to show you, is the first week, um, or even in the overview, depending on the course, I always make sure for the first time that they're using a tool that I place instructions, very, very detailed instructions. So this is their first post using VoiceThread. So I actually will say, here's a link to start using VoiceThread here. Um, here's how I'm looking for you to comment. Here's the tool and how to comment. And then it gives them very specifics about the actual tool. Um, I also then tend to create an announcement. So I always use the announcements in conjunction with a new tool. And so, for example, this one gives them examples of how to use VoiceThread and Wakelet and how they can prepare so they're not, um, you know, caught off guard using this at the last minute. I also use our AT, <laughs> our Academic Technology Office, um, as try to do that as a last resort. But if a student is still struggling, they'll work with AT to figure out why they're having a problem accessing that tool. That's terrific. Thank you. Let's let's turn now to uh, Christina's question. We think we have the echo resolved. Christina, take us away. I hope we got the echo resolved. So I love seeing this. I've made a note of a few of the external tools I haven't uh, seen before to go play with. I love how you've integrated those. I wanted to ask, um, do you have it set up that the students have to complete an activity before the Zoom session, sort of like a pass to class like they did with some of the uh, flipped classroom models before we all went Zooming? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and two, two quick answers. Um, and, you know, I'm available for questions after this, obviously, via email, anything. Um, so, yes. So I'm very strategic about we know we're going to meet on a certain date. So I make sure they're doing specific readings or assignments. And sometimes the assignment, right, the video post for their community, that's going to be actually the activity. So they're only doing a post to get them ready and have all the information. When we actually meet synchronously, I'll have an activity where they'll break up into groups and use the breakout room and Zoom, and they'll actually dissect the, the assignment they had done previous to it. So I try to connect the weeks prior to the meetings with the meetings and use the meetings not for lecture because I'll put the lectures right here within Sakai's platform for them to watch. But I make it known that if they come to the meeting and they haven't done the readings, I will know <laughs> because they won't be able to participate without doing the readings um, or doing watching the presentations because the activity will be based completely on what they've done so far. All right. We are approaching 15 minutes. There are a bunch of questions in the chat. So I think what I would like to do is to capture these questions. And if we've got time in a later, after the, the other segments, we'll return to Krista if she can stick around for that long. Um, and otherwise, we'll find some way for those questions to get answered. So I will I will take the action item to keep on top of these questions because there are several of them. Let's turn now to Natalina Parker from Pepperdine University. Thank you. Uh, Krista, that was amazing. Uh, I love your template design and, and I love anytime I hear the word standardization and template. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so as Josh mentioned, uh, I'm going to just be showcasing a new faculty self-paced orientation site. 
Uh, so quickly, going to real quick just go through this slide presentation, um, and then we're going to dive into the, the sneak peek of the course shell. So who is this for? Um, all of our new adjunct faculty are required to participate in a new faculty orientation. So what this is, is the administration of the new faculty orientation. It has everything that um, faculty would need for onboarding. It also gives them a huge knowledge bank of resources that they not only can access before um, they start teaching with us, they can access it through the duration of their time here with us at PGBS at Pepperdine. So um, it's a win-win because it's all in, in one spot. Um, also, as Josh mentioned, this is a self-paced course, so they can access it whenever they've processed their paperwork. We can go ahead and assign them to the, the course site, and then they can go through at their own um, pace. We do ask that they finish it before we have our synchronous portion of the new faculty orientation, um, but we're flexible in case there's different circumstances or accommodations that we need to um, work with. The biggest reason is the why. So why for several reasons. One, we are showcasing and modeling a Quality Matters designed uh, course that has everything for students to uh, know what to do. It meets all accessibility requirements. So we want to kind of model that experience for our faculty who many of them are accessing Sakai for the very first time. So not only are they getting this huge knowledge bank of resources that they continue to take can access. They also are feeling more empowered to, you know, understand Sakai from a student experience. And many times then that will transfer um, into designing their course modeled based on to the, the experience that they just had in this new faculty orientation. So we're going to dive right into the course shell. Hopefully it'll pop up, but I do have it here. So we'll just go here. Um, so I'm in uh, a student view right now. So this is the NFO, New Faculty Orientation Template site. So uh, even if a, a faculty did not catch the email how to get started here, if they can just access this course site, it gives them exactly the steps that they need to do to get started. Um, they also have, you know, the welcome message. So this just kind of gives a brief description of what this is. We always have an announcement similar to like Krista mentioned in her course design, even from a faculty perspective, we want to start building a community for whomever is in this class. So we do ask that faculty participate in an introduction and burning question. And both myself as well as our Center for Teaching and Learning Excellent Director and a few other folks from Academic Affairs, we participate in this as well. So we really model, hey, add a picture um, and whatnot. Then we dive into the learning modules. Um, Again, many of our adjunct faculty aren't available to meet with us during our, you know, staff business hours. So many times they're not sure how to access something and they have to wait until the morning for us to respond. So the way we built this out is everything that they would need from the administrative portion of becoming a new faculty is embedded right here. They don't need to Google where's the faculty handbook or you know where the payroll schedule is. So everything is just linked out. If they do have a question, they know exactly who they're going to, to talk to. Um, since I did mention this was a required course, um, we do ask that they have an, or complete a knowledge check after each module. So this is just the testing quizzes tool that's baked in as a knowledge check. Um, this knowledge check will go towards the you know, a certification. So faculty, believe it or not, do feel empowered after obtaining a certification after completing this course. One of our adjuncts actually sent me a picture. He posted it in his uh, place of business office. So um, again, there's a lot of wins for for having faculty having access to a course like this, but um, I won't go through all of these, but as, as I mentioned, um, this would be more of our Pepperdine systems. So again, rather than trying to Google, how do I find my network ID or um, how do, you know, what does CAS mean? So it's all just baked in right here. Faculty just go from one, you know, module to another. And then again, we have that knowledge check. So we talk about ordering class materials. We have a class audit and also most of our faculty aren't aware that Savinic grades in Sakai does not actually submit um, for, for students uh, grades. So we have that listed here. And again, they take a, a knowledge check question. Um, a couple other things, library resources. Um, we talk about our PGBS teaching model, introduce our Center for Teaching Learning Excellence. Um, we do also talk about all of the different programs we have here and some campus specific information because we have several campuses in Southern California. 
And then we also embed a new faculty orientation, orientation checklist um, and faculty are asked to take an evaluation, um, just you know, talking about their experience here. And then after each um, trimester, we actually go in and make some revisions, which is actually why we have the new faculty orientation checklist at the end is a faculty said it, but it was in each module, it was a little much. So we just moved this um, towards the end. As I mentioned, um, if they complete 73% of the knowledge uh, checks accurately, then they would obtain this cert certi certificate. So that's just the certification tool here. We also have some web content links here. Um, this you know, isn't as um, relevant at the moment, but we were constantly updating this for COVID um, information. And then this takes them directly to our IT support, staff direct directory, technology resources, um, WaveNet. And then we get into all these optional resources that would talk more about active engagement. So these are optional, but the great thing is, is by the time they come and meet with either myself and my colleague, we're a mighty team of two instructional designers, we don't have to answer a lot of these questions because they've already gone through this course. So we can really focus on what we do best, right? Designing an active engaging course and teach them all about accessibility and all the other things. So it's really been a win-win um, for all of our faculty as well as um, other staff that is asked to be a part of this site just so that they can have everything they kind of need in, in a one-stop shop. Wow, I think that silence means that you have uh, the end of your of your talk for us, right? Yes, and my under the minutes, my over. I'm usually a big That's talker, right. so I try to stay <laughs> within right. the you, time. You, as uh, you you return your time to no. Okay, so that that's amazing. So thank you so much for showing us this. Um, we are just pushing seven minutes into your 15 minute block. That means there are plenty of time for questions, which is terrific. So let me turn to our panel of super fans first. So uh, Christina, since you went second, let's start with you first this time. All right, I will admit I was taking detailed notes to steal this idea. I love it, that's, that's the best. You know when you really hit it, when someone else says, that's amazing, I have to do that too. No, one of my faculty is also um, in the Zoom conference and she sent me a private message saying, we really need this. Can we take this up in fall? It's like, I've already been making notes. Yeah, well, happy to share. In all of your spare time, you can execute this in like a, a couple of weeks left before the fall semester, right? I'm sure. Yeah, in my great amount of spare time. But I was curious, um, is it entirely um, sort of unmanned, or do you have people in there who are serving as mentors, answering questions, and helping guide someone who might be a little lost or overwhelmed? Yeah, great question. Um, so as I mentioned, we want to try to model like what it would be like um, if they were teaching this class. So I have uh, kind of passed on the baton after I created this course to the academic affairs department. And I've talked with um, the wonderful colleague of mine that, that manages it. And I remind her, you've got to do check-ins, right? Like if it is coming up like, hey, you know, the new faculty orientation is in 10 days, please make sure you're checking, you know, the knowledge checks. And um, so I've been trying to mentor her that not only does it remind them that they need to make sure that they're going through some things, but also that you're here to ask questions. We do also offer our support if there was anything pertaining to the course shell um, itself. Um, but a lot of those items there wouldn't come to my team, um, our instructional design e-learning team. Um, but anyhow, yes, so we do try to do check-ins and whatnot. And um, again, I get the feedback because we then, um, you know, kind of talk about this self-paced course in the actual synchronous new faculty orientation portion. And faculty, you know, did say, oh, you know, now that you were reminding us to do check-ins, I'm going to do that with my students as well, no matter what modality it is. So, like I said, not only, you know, there's an alternative motive here, right? This is so resourceful for the faculty, but the way that we designed it was to make sure that, you know, also it is teaching our faculty who may not have any, you know, really teaching experience. We have a lot of apprentices in, in, in our, um, you know, faculty as, as adjuncts, so it really is even training them how they can then embrace Sakai and, and still, you know, connect with their students all the time. All right, thanks. Um, Christina, do you, do you have a follow-up that you want to ask before we turn to Julianne? Nope, it's just a great, uh, great opportunity to model best practices. 
All right, Julianne, over to you. Thank you so much for showing that site. I definitely was also taking notes on what we can do for our new faculty because we just have an in-person at this time. Um, I really like the knowledge checks and also the contact information with the pictures of the people. I think that adds some really good um, personalization. Um, I was wondering, <laughs> this is not too much about Takai, but what is the completion rate? I know you said it's required, but do you have pretty good completion of it? Yes. Um, so faculty do get a small stipend, um, which before, you know, was an eight hour, you know, new faculty orientation. So this is why we now have the administrative portion just completely, you know, part of the self-paced. Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as, you know, I'm aware, um, faculty will complete it, but there does, you know, need to be uh, some, some nudging and encouraging. And as I mentioned um, when I was uh, presenting is there is some flexibility. So we ask that they complete it before they schedule a consultation with the ID team. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, um, but we remind them that they do need to complete it. Um, and then, like I said, we'll we'll extend the date of the knowledge checks if necessary, just so that everyone can, you know, have an opportunity to complete it. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking, I was wondering if there was a stipend, so that's helpful to know because I don't yeah. think we can ask our faculty to volunteer to do it and have completion, so. Right. So, Natalina, there, there's a question in the chat from Dave Evelyn who asks, mm -hmm. Uh, are they permitted to teach if they don't finish this? It seems like there's a lot of important information. Be more of a question to academic affairs, but um, like I said, there's there's really not. I, I think there's eight. No, sorry, there's eleven total knowledge checks, and there's multiple attempts, so um, they can you know keep retaking it. Most faculty, you know, we haven't had any pushback, or like I said, um, I've had to assist our colleague of how to extend the knowledge checks, and um, this is the fifth time that we've, you know, um, I guess deployed this since I've been part of this team and I've maybe had to do that a handful of times. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, our adjunct faculty are motivated. They want to know, they want to be empowered to, to learn on their own. And like I mentioned, we have a fantastic, you know, tech central support, um, but they're not able to answer necessarily questions on where do I, you know, send my, how do I order my books or things like that. So, um, you know, I do think, you know, we see the statistics, faculty are going in there all the time, even after they've taught, right? They may not teach with us for a couple, you know, trimesters and then they're back. You know, it's all right there. They can just go back in and, and, and you know, refresh um, their, their skills on their own. So, um, yeah, so I don't think they need to be required or I think that they can still teach, but we do highly encourage that they, they finish it. And I do think since there's that stipend added, they, they probably are very much more encouraged to, to complete it. All right, thanks. Um, are there other questions either from, well, actually, let me, let me ask, let me ask it this way. Are there questions from our participants that you'd like to pose to Natalina? Do you reimburse adjunct faculty for their time for this? Yes. Of required new faculty orientation. Um, so in the overview that I went through real quick, um, this is only an hour to an hour and a half to complete. Um, so part of that original new faculty orientation that was much longer, um, this is just part of that. But now rather than having it all synchronous on Zoom, we have some of it, um, this asynchronous self-paced, and then um, the face-to-face, -face, which is the, the synchronous Zoom portion of it. So Oh, and here, here's a killer question. Wow, all the questions are rolling in now. Um, Dave Evelyn asks the question of the day, uh, what issues were you really trying to solve with this? Uh, with this course, design build, um, we want to make sure that our faculty that aren't working necessarily maybe with an instructional design team um, are, are able to see, you know, when they get a Sakai course shell, you know, many of them that don't have training see lessons and wonder, what is this? I have no idea. And I don't know how I can, you know, um, start with this. So I think it's just an opportunity for, you know, first and foremost, in my role, I want to make sure that I'm able to support all faculty and most of our adjuncts aren't available from eight to five when I'm available. So I want to make sure that they have everything they need that I would typically be providing during, you know, the working hours uh, potentially. But also I think at the end of the day, we really just want to model quality course design. Um, and so, like I mentioned, it's a win-win. We're modeling that, but we're also, um, you know, showcasing 
all of the information they will need to get started working for Pepperdine in one spot. I wish I had that when I started working at Pepperdine. <laughs> My, my uh, office mate with very short legs decided she was going to jump, and that's really would just have been a bad plan. <laughs> so, all right, um, Natalie, that's that's amazing. We are at about fifteen minutes. This is this is perfect. Um, there are there's some great conversation going on in the chat, including some conversation about uh, Sakai not submitting grades. I want to note that that tends to be an institution specific policy decision. There are some institutions that have already implemented uh, submission of grades directly from Sakai to their student information system. So that's something that can be worked on on an institutional basis. The technology to do it exists already. So uh, I'll be keeping track of the other questions in chat. The four that were left over from Krista's session, she has responded to in chat already. So Krista, thank you so much for that. So you're welcome to keep firing questions either for Krista or for Natalina in the chat as, as we move forward. And I'll make sure those get to the right place and try and feed those into the conversation as we go. Um, Natalina, thank you. That was amazing. I really, really appreciate that. Let me turn now to our third expert of the day. Well, or this is this will be an expert team from the University of Dayton. So instructional designers, Sarah Tangerman and instructor Katarina Tsuma, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's nice to be a part of this. It's been so great to see these other classes. There are so many good ideas there. Um, my name is Sarah Tangeman. I'm an instructional designer at the University of Dayton. I am here with Katerina Zuma, one of our faculty from the biology department. Um, she and I are going to be taking a look at a class that we've collaborated on starting in the spring and really still working on. We're still working on it. <laughs> it's not quite, quite finished yet. We're still collaborating on that. Um, but this is a physiology one class. And before I hand things over to her, I wanted to talk a little bit about the nature of how we came to work on this class together. Um, Katerina was uh, part of a faculty development program that we do here at UD that we call e-learning fellows or ELF. And we each work with different faculty that we call our elves. So Katerina was one of my elves, which I love so much. And um, we work during the spring. This is an annual program that runs with a cohort of about 12 faculty. And faculty can apply to be a part of this, this program. And then um, the way they're chosen um, has to do with like the kind of value, one of the reasons, the value that their course could bring to their department, but also to the university as a whole. And in Katerina's case, there was a real need for this class that she was bringing to us, this potential to design this class using Sakai to um, present this class in an online format because her department has, had never done this before for this particular class and there was a real demand from the students. So we knew this was an important class that we need to work on. Um, when we started uh, working on the course, we ran into some issues at the beginning. Uh, there were definitely things that needed to be worked out, um, like even what kind of modality we were going to use for this. That was a big decision for Katerina. And then also importantly, the organization and the structure of the course. So we spent a lot of time doing some pretty incredible like mental acrobatics to figure out how to fit her course into the schedule that we had. It's running currently right now in the summer, the second session. So this is a short semester that she's trying to fit this really difficult content into, and she's done a really brilliant job, I think. Um, and it's been a great collaboration. So she's going to show you around, um, around the course, I think focusing on the way that we're using that lessons tab, which we've renamed to modules to kind of show off how, you know, we're using that course and uh, organizing it in a way that's consistent for students to go through. So Katerina, do you want to take over from there and show off your course? Sure. Uh, thank okay. you, Sarah. So um, let me share my screen here. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Sarah said, we're going to uh, show you around the uh, Sakai version that we use at the <laughs> University of Dayton. Its name is Isidore. And so we have a uh, a website for our Physiology One uh, course. Uh, this is typically uh, just a few things about the course. It's it's a course typically taken. It's a high level biomed, uh, an upper level biomedical course. It's typically taken by juniors and seniors, 
And these are not only biology majors, but also students that want to apply to health professional schools. This class is um, either required or highly recommended for entrance to health professional schools or for taking standardized uh, entry tests like MCAT or DAT, depending on, on the school. So there has been uh, a demand uh, on behalf of the students and uh, this class has been developed to, to be offered by our department uh, in, in the summer for the first time. So this is an online asynchronous class and Sarah has done a marvelous job putting together the impossible because this is a rigorous class. It's a demanding class. It has a lot of material. So anyways, let me guide you around. I wanna focus here. So uh, the module stool is actually the, uh, the, the lesson stool that we renamed into modules. And uh, we do have four modules in total in this asynchronous class, which was a daunting task to begin with because we have six weeks and four thematic units. So dividing six by four can be very hard at times. Uh, so uh, uh, here in the, in the, first of all, I want to say what I like about the module stool here is that it's mostly a one-stop shop for the students. So a student can go to the module stool and they can find everything that they need in the class, including what they need to do and all material. So this tool begins with uh, getting started, let's say section, which includes some information. And I think this is really helpful for the students. This was Sarah's idea, uh, by the way. Uh, so some information for students, if a student has not taken an online class before, like what do, do they need to do to succeed in it? Um, how to build connections with peers, how to organize their material and so on. In the next section of this tab, they can also have a very quick overview of what they need to do in the class, what materials they, they're required to you know, access, uh, what the, uh, the assessments are gonna be like and so on. And this is a very quick overview. And in the end, they also have a link to the forums tool where they can initiate um, um, uh, conversations and ask questions. And then if we go back to the modules tool, uh, you can see that we have four modules. Uh, each module begins with an overview of the information, including the thematic uh, a, a component, the duration, the dates, and the due dates within the module. So students, we, we try to keep this constant so students kind of know that they have something to do on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, for example. Uh, these are shown here, but if students click on this uh, tab, they can see, of course, more information. So each module begins with a banner, hopefully it, adds, it draws their attention, and some questions on things that they're going to learn about. I have to say that these are, as you understand, the most uh, interesting ones. Uh, and over here, we have on the right-hand side, we have a shout out on my behalf. These can be more or less intimidating. In this case, it's a little bit more, there. it draws their attention to the multiple due dates. Uh, but some of the ones are uh, more uh, funny. Uh, in in uh, this section, they, we have the learning outcomes very clearly stated. And over here, we have a miniature of the uh, calendar. They can find this in many uh, different uh, parts of the site so that they can keep track. So uh, what I like here is that below, they can find each due date uh, and they can expand each of them. And uh, the idea here is to keep the same format over and over so that they can find everything they need within this space. So uh, the first thing that they see is a list, a checklist of things they need to complete. And everything that needs to be completed can also be found in their respective section over here. So over here, we have the video lectures, the reading assignments. The reading assignments, by the way, can be accessed only uh, indirectly because we're using a neat text with its own platform for activities and so. And this uh, can be uh, uh, accessed from its own um, tool, which is the My Textbooks tool. Uh, but uh, there's detailed instructions for them on how to access it. They also have the materials that they need, links to assessments. So over here, we're actually using a clone site of our actual site, so we don't have an active link right now here, but in the actual site, there is an active link to the quiz, uh, the office hour section, and so on. And this uh, repeats throughout. Uh, the only difference that we have here 
is the tab for the exam, mainly because different uh, things are due on that day. So they have uh, assignments that are due and they can access and submit them directly through here. And uh, the exam is also not uh, accessed directly here. As I said before, this is a, a class that is uh, either required or highly recommended for standardized tests. So to uh, make sure that we uh, maintain the rigor, they need to access uh, their exam through a proctoring software, which is uh, known as ProctorTrack. And in any case, they can also find a Zoom link here to reach me in case they, they want to ask questions. So with that uh, said, I want to I wanna, uh, kind of uh, complete this by thanking the online learning uh, folks in our uh, university because they're doing an excellent work and uh, Sarah in particular for, for being uh, for having been inspired, you know, uh, the inspiration of this uh, website. So thank you, Sarah, for putting everything together. It's been, it's been a good collaboration, I think. <laughs> right. All right. Let's, that, that was super. Thank you. Let's turn to our panel of super fans. I want to start with Julianne, who I suspect is well aware of and knowledgeable about this course. So Julianne, um, this will be an extra on the spot putting for you. So I'm curious what your reactions are and what questions you would pose from your knowledgeable seat at this moment. Wow, thank you for showing that. I've seen the course, but I haven't seen it in this much detail in this walkthrough. So um, let me... I guess my question is more general because it is so hard to combine this much information into this short amount of time. Um, what was the thought process and collaboration between the two of you in figuring out how best to lay out this course? Because I think it's really organized and I know there's lots of due dates and there's lots happening, but can you tell us a little bit about that collaboration of how it's best to determine that schedule? Um, I, I'll start really quickly and just say that we struggled with it a lot. I feel like this was like the first month of we spent our time trying to figure out how you could possibly get this to fit. I think at one point I even asked ChatGPT for help <laughs> and didn't get any, by the way. <laughs> I feel like I should mention it was not helpful. Um, but it was uh, Katerina who ultimately came up with the schedule and figured out how she could break up this content in a way that it would be structured. We really just wanted to find that consistency and since she's the one that's the subject matter expert, she was able to really go through and dissect and figure out like how best to kind of group things together and organize this. It was it was tough organizing this because it is a lot of content in a short period of time. Did you have anything to add with that, Katerina? Well, actually, uh, no, I agree with you. It, it has been uh, at times it has been difficult to figure things out, but I think in a weird way, every time that we talked about it, it kind of sold itself. I don't know, like it's, it's probably you. Uh, so Sarah uh, has also been an, an instructor, as you know, so she has uh, great experience with that as well. So I was not the only instructor in the team. So her combined knowledge of, you know, the using the Sakai and uh, having taught in the past has been really helpful in figuring out uh, how to tackle certain uh, difficulties. All right, thanks for that succinct answer to that question. And uh, Julian, thanks for posing it. Let's turn now to Christina in Ann Arbor. Wow, this sounds like a sports talk show. Christina in Ann Arbor, <laughs> what, what, what is your question? This is beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. I just wanted to ask, um, I've seen this in the, I've seen people asking this in the chat too, um, but what was your decision-making, your reason behind using the collapsible sections um, for so much of the course design, the modules page, rather than just have it be um, expanded, you know, oh, something that they can't clap so they don't have the excuse of, I collapsed it and then I didn't see it no more. And I didn't realize it was collapsible or uncollapsible. You want me to answer that, Katerina? Um, I think the, the best thing about that is that it prevents your student from having to just scroll endlessly. You know, if all of these were open, that is so overwhelming and it's so much content and the collapsible um, layouts are really wonderful because it gives a student an opportunity to just open up what they need to deal with for that due date. Um, I, you know, I always use these. I've never had an issue with a, a student who claimed to not know that they could you know, col collapse or open up a layout. Um, I think especially with how many, how, many, how much we're giving in terms of instruction, I think if a student were to claim that they didn't realize that they had to access their, their work here, I don't know that I would necessarily buy it. Um, but 
uh, it's it's mainly to kind of keep everything on their page and keep it, you know, so that everything's at hand and not overwhelming because it is a lot of content and could get overwhelming pretty quickly. Have you had any issues with students saying they didn't know that they could open up a layout? Not before? at all. Not at all. Yeah. I've never had that happen. And I agree. And if I may add something, the fact that, uh, the, the, at least in my experience, the fact that everything is so consistent, even though it is collapsible, students will see the same format every time that they collapse something. And that helps them, you know, get into the habit of knowing what to do and where to find things. So I don't, I, I think it should be okay and they should be fine <laughs> with doing that. <laughs> I think so too. And what about right. on the modules page? It seemed like that being expanded by default. I don't know um, if there's, I guess, questioning, you know, why, why have the modules list also be collapsible as well? Well, a lot of that is just to kind of give like an overview of the course. Um, so, I mean, they're spending like, what, two and a half weeks or so in a single module. So most of the time is within a module, but the module page gives them this overview of the entire semester. But then most of the time they're going into a single module, they're staying there for a, quite a bit of time and then just working their way through those layouts um, and then going back out to that module page where they can see that overview again. I've had classes before where as I've finished a section on this main page, I've collapsed it, but I'm not even sure how much that matters. Again, with the consistency where everything's the same, the students learn where they need to go. There's also information in that getting to like getting started section that explains how this works. Um, they're familiar with Isidore Sakai, the way that we we use it here. And so this is something they see in their other classes as well. I, I, ha I think it's a fair question, but I haven't had it be an issue before with any of my classes, not in my experience. Let me turn now to a question uh, from the chat, and I recognize it is 12.01 p.m. Eastern. I am standing between you and lunch. I hate being that person, but this is a pretty good question, and I think this, this will uh, be a good way for us to close out. Um, I just want to note there's a uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the, in the chat, um, and uh, the most recent question in the chat was one for uh, Chris Knapp in Ann Arbor uh, about whether... Uh, expand collapse in lessons is keyboard accessible now. And that might be something interesting to address uh, either offline or in the face-to-face -face portion of the uh, of tomorrow's 9 a.m. hour, which is gonna focus on lessons and accessibility. So here's this last question. Before I, I offer this, let me just thank our, our experts, uh, Sarah and Katerina, Krista and Natalina. Um, let me also thank our super fans, uh, Christina and Julianne, you guys killed it as you always do. So thank you so much. So here's here's the last question, and this was uh, this was posed to Sarah and Katerina, and then after this we will wrap up and move to our lunch break. And here we go. How do you track participation or engagement in individual modules? So there's there's been some conversation about this in the chat. Um, Dave Evelyn has suggested some thoughts about how he would do it. Amy Dries uh, from Northwest State Community College has suggested how she would do it. And I'm, I'm very curious to hear from the, the folks at Dayton. What's your response to this? What do you think, Katerina? So uh, my view in these uh, situations is that when the student is goal oriented, they they should, you know, participate for their own uh, benefit. But there there are ways I know that there are ways for us to track uh, whether students are keeping up with their lectures, their assigned lectures. So we do have a tool in Warpwire that uh, allows us to uh, track, like take a look at the analytics, uh, whether a student has been uh, um, following up with the assigned lectures and so on. There is also assignments that they need to complete on a regular basis and uh, assessments. And these are, one way for for me to see whether they're keeping up with their assigned material. Sarah, I don't know if you have any other. I, I would agree with that. I think, um, you know, there are some some tools like warp wire that have analytics in them or even, you know, using some other type of like external training package or something. But I think a lot of it with this, you know, even if you were going to to see if someone viewed your videos, um, 
you know, you can't always guarantee that they're actually watching those videos. It's just that they like had the video on. And so, you know, there's only so much that you can, you know, manage as the instructor. You give them the work to complete and uh, the assignments to complete and the assessments. And then um, I think it's usually pretty clear the ones that aren't, aren't following up with the work or not. But, but yeah, that's about the extent of it in terms of the modules tab, like going through and, and like seeing who's doing what. All right. Thank you both for that answer. So thanks to uh, thanks again to everyone for some really neat sharing of ideas. So uh, Krista Daniels from Antioch, thank you. Natalina Parker from Pepperdine, thank you. Sarah Tangeman and uh, Katarina Tsuma from Dayton, thank you all. This was this was super fun. I always find these sessions really energizing. I hope you did too. So. Uh, at this point, we are going to turn off the recording. We are going to move to a lunch break. So the, the folks in Ann Arbor will uh, probably have calories fed to them. Everyone else will, you know, on the Eastern time zone will be responsible for your own calories. So we're going to come back at 1230 p.m. Eastern in about 25 minutes for uh, Julianne Morgan's seven, seven favorite things about Sakai lessons. Wow, if I could speak, it would be great. Seven favorite things about Sakai lessons. So this is really not to be missed. So come back in 25 minutes at 12.30 uh, p.m. Eastern, and we will see you all then. Wilma, any uh, last minute program notes before we wrap up this session? No, just a big thank you to all of our presenters and our super fans. You guys rock. Um, so thank you so much for sharing and have a great lunch.